Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi and welcome to My Week. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. As you can see, we are on the road this week. We are at Wayne State University, where we are marking the anniversary of Detroit emerging from bankruptcy. This event was put on by the Detroit Journalism Cooperative, which is a group of nonprofit media organizations, Detroit Public Television, along with Bridge Magazine, WDET Radio, Michigan Radio, and New Michigan Media. We've all been working together over the past year to tell Detroit's story. There's been a lot of change this year in Detroit some improvements in services and in governments, but there are also some challenges that loom and threaten the city's recovery. One year since Detroit emerged from the biggest municipal bankruptcy in history with a plan of adjustment that is a must-follow roadmap for Detroit's recovery. This past year, the Detroit Journalism Cooperative has worked to tell the stories. Is Detroit improving? Is city government living up to promises made? Where are we one year later? First, the improvements. I see the lights up. I see the guys working out there. If I need a light, I can call. Hey, I need a light on this corner right here. Certainly, they'll come in and investigate, and I'm looking for that light. Neighborhoods are seeing the light. The city has updated, repaired, and installed more than 56,000 new LED streetlights. The $185 million upgrade is 80% complete. There are 80 new buses rolling out on the streets of Detroit for the first time in 20 years. More buses mean more on-time schedules, making a difference for riders getting to jobs and school. Littered city streets are now picked up by a sanitation team addressing the 650 tons of illegally dumped trash every week. I think one of the biggest things is, uh, is bulk trash pickup. You're not having as much trash around the city and that's, that's huge. The ongoing fight against blight has accelerated. Crews demolished more than 7,000 homes throughout Detroit at the rate of 100 to 150 homes per week. <laughs> 250 city parks are now blooming with life thanks to the city, volunteers, and community organizations. City services have really elevated um, beautification projects in southwest Detroit. We're really transforming the overall perception and elevating the quality of life. Detroit is also getting tech savvy with four new mobile apps to help the public with everything from connecting to police to paying for parking. Now click. Detroit remains one of the most dangerous cities in the country, though violent crime is down 4%, but response time for emergencies is improving. The fire department added GPS and new software that helped cut call intake time. Police response to priority one crimes has decreased to just over 16 and a half minutes. The city is meeting and exceeding its financial goals with oversight from the Financial Review Commission. But for all of the progress, there are concerns. The growing price tag for blight removal, the large city pension contribution due in less than 10 years, creating jobs and educating a workforce to fill them, reassessing inflated property values, stabilizing neighborhoods faced with a wave of foreclosures, revamping a struggling Detroit public school system, and growing the city's population. I think a lot of people are committed uh, to doing a lot of good things. I think we're in a wonderfully, powerfully positive place. I believe this is a magic moment. I think the things that connect us as a region are far greater than the things that might divide us. 
Coming up tonight, you'll hear from several key people who were involved in the bankruptcy process for their perspective, Governor Rick Snyder, also U.S. bankruptcy judge who is now retired, Stephen Rhodes, and most importantly, from the people who live in the city of Detroit. But we do start with our contributors here on My Week, Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from the Detroit Free Press. Guys, how are you? Good. We like this set. Well, I was just going to say, you guys look like you're not sitting, to do that on you're, camera. You're sitting <laughs> on an airline seat together. That's what so it we're awful like. close. We like to make we, it cozy we here on My see, Week. We we need one of those, at the studio. We need one of those things. One we of need those a arm divider. Well, you need a divider. Yeah, right? He's over his. Down, he's right? crossed his Am I line. over the half? Right? Please. I'll move over. You guys are your own reality <laughs> show. <laughs> Look for that next year on Bravo. Um, but hey, let's talk a little bit about because our whole show is focused around. This is the year since Detroit has emerged right. from bankruptcy. Nolan, what were some of the biggest surprises for you in this past year? Well, my biggest surprise was how well the the bankruptcy served the city's interest. I feel like it was a triumph for the city. I, we went into the bankruptcy. I was among those predicting that this would be just a disaster for Detroit. <clears throat> it would lose its assets. The employees would be just stripped of all of their pensions and other benefits, and that it would be sort of set the city back 50 years or more. And instead, it was a triumph. We came out of the city with, or the bankruptcy with more resources for services, with a stronger balance sheet, much stronger, with all the assets intact. The employees took a hit, but not nearly as large as, as people thought. And I think it set the city on a course that should be upward for a number of years to come. So you have a generally positive feeling about where we've been this, this, this past year. Do you agree with him? I think uh, there's no question that things uh, from a financial perspective are much better for the city than they were going into the bankruptcy. That's the point of bankruptcy. You reorganize your debt in a way that allows you uh, to have uh, more cash free to do the things that are your core business. In the city's case, that's deliver services. Uh, we are seeing more money plowed into services in the city uh, now than we were before. But, uh, but again, I mean, it's slow. Uh, it, it is uh, something that's going to take a long time for a lot of people who live in the city to feel the bankruptcy was about fixing City Hall. It was not about fixing Detroit. That's the work that lies ahead for all of us now. And, and I think that that's very interesting because you can say point out all the positives, yeah. Nolan, but you have people that are still feel so angry about what happened here in the city of Detroit and the emergency management and the fact that there is bankruptcy and the cuts to pensioners yeah. um, that they can't see. Is it that they cannot see some of the positive changes or is it just what Stephen says is they're not impacted by some of the change, that it is so slow? The conditions in the neighborhoods were allowed to deteriorate to the point where, you know, it's going to it's going to take a long time. For, for them to improve and people are frustrated and they are living in conditions that are basically third world. So while the tra tra trajectory is up, it's gonna take a long time to fix the things that uh, went wrong over 60 years. Is there something that the city could have done better in this year? In this year, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't, think, I don't think so. I mean, there isn't a whole lot of money uh, that, that uh, they have to do the things that they need to do. I mean, they are in better shape than they were before bankruptcy, but it's not like they're flush or anything. Maybe it's $100 million, $150 million a year that they now are not paying to creditors that they can apply on the services, but you could spend $100 million in a weekend uh, in Detroit and not see the difference when you talk about the neighborhoods that have deteriorated uh, to the point where they, they need far more. And so uh, you hate to counsel patients because that's one of the things yeah. that I think gets pushed on Detroiters a lot. Be patient. Just wait. wait. It's just going to happen. Uh, and for years that was told to them and nothing ever happened. But we really are in a place where uh, where the things that, that are going to, to change the neighborhoods are going to take a little bit of time uh, to get started and then to have the effect that, that people will notice. What should have happened is the fixing of the school system should have worked in tandem with the fixing of the city. And there's no reason it shouldn't have. You still have Detroit children being cheated out of their futures by schools that just don't measure up. As schools that have been under state control for six years, we shouldn't be here right now. And if, this does, if, that, if that issue isn't addressed and in addressed in the right way very quickly, 
I don't think the recovery goes on. Yeah, and you talk about patience, and you talk about telling people to wait, and I, there are a lot of parents who are sick of waiting. We're going to talk about schools. We're going to talk about public safety. also want to talk about neighborhoods as well um, and some of the city services that we're, that we're seeing and, and, and also the culture at City Hall. So we're going to talk about all of that as we, as we talk about this year since Detroit has come out of bankruptcy. But at this DJC event that we had here at Wayne State University, I said we had several people kind of sitting here on the stage and, and talking from their perspective and how the bankruptcy process was, and one of those people was was Governor Rick Snyder, and here's what he had to say. With respect to Detroit, I'm proud of what took place here. Um, Detroit had been in decline for a lot of years, and it's an opportunity to get Detroit on a positive path. It's exciting to see things in the video and other exciting things going on in the community, and I appreciate the good work the mayor and the city council are doing now. This is how we all partner together to have Detroit grow and bring it back. The bankruptcy process really created a framework for success because it really broke that cycle of saying services were diminishing to the citizens in this city for decades. And the bankruptcy really provided a platform, a forum, to say, let's get that stabilized. That's the point of the bankruptcy. Let's get it stabilized and create an environment for growth and success to come out of it. And the good part is, is you've got some good leaders now that are helping make that transition happen. Now for some perspective from the man who sat behind the bench while the deals were being made, retired U.S. bankruptcy judge Stephen Rhodes. From what I can tell, the city is doing amazingly well. I'm very pleased uh, with how the city is, is doing. It's, um, it's, it's thriving, and, and as far as I can tell, it's, it's city services are being restored and financially it's doing better than we had projected in the bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. It has a surplus in its, in its city budget uh, and its, uh, its balance sheet has been fixed so it's on a path to recover and I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Do I have concerns? Yes, I have concerns and I've expressed them. Uh, my first uh, major concern is with the pension plans themselves. We have to be very careful to be sure that uh, all of the pension obligations that the city is obligated uh, to make over uh, the next decade are met. Um, it's a little bit of a moving target, but it's, it's a big target, and, I and, I'm, and I'm glad to see that the, the governor and the Financial Review Commission have their eye on that and will do whatever is necessary to make that big payment that comes up in eight or nine years. Right. I'm also concerned about the Detroit school system because as I have said, families will only move back into the city, which is what we all want, when the school system is fixed. Beyond that, of course, there are 40 some thousand kids in the city of Detroit school system now that need the best possible school system that we can give them. Perhaps the most important group of people that we need to hear from as we look back over this past year are people who actually live in the city of Detroit. Well, I think Detroit is uh, much better off after the bankruptcy, absolutely. We're seeing uh, streetlights, we're seeing demolition, we're seeing property values go up, so I think it's much, much better. It appears that the city is better off uh, a year after the bankruptcy. It looks as though action is being taken to rectify a lot of the things that um, the residents were concerned about. I think that the, the new district managers have done a great job of creating connections in the community to uh, the local government, whether that's by trying to address issues of the lighting or blighted properties. There's an attitude, there's a spirit, there's a feeling, uh, there's a sense that something positive is going on. I think in my community, one of the most pressing things has been the influx of new populations. A lot of these like uh, quality of life issues that the mayor is wanting to focus on, but I think in many ways have not necessarily always trickled down in the best way to the longtime residents of the city. We'd like to see more police presence in the neighborhoods. I think the school systems, you know, the mayor had to look at that, the powers to be have to look at that in order to get more residents in the city. People are moving here from all over the world, but it's like you can't disregard the residents, the, real, the Detroiters, the people that have been here living in the city 
since the beginning. The fact is, sometimes this is a tale of two cities because while good things are happening in certain parts of the city, there are a lot of folk who don't know that economic revitalization and economic recovery is here. In order to truly build the city of Detroit, you have to recognize and make sure that the people that have lived here are also respected and retained. I'm hopeful for the future of Detroit because uh, we have the energy. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we are looking at what's going on and, and there's some positive feedback there. You know, it's just exciting us. I have seen like the very cross sections of many cultures getting, um, collaborating and wanting to do something better for their community. Detroit is one of the most resilient cities that, that you know, I think is around the world. I see uh, bright lights, I see uh, uh, restaurants and businesses and grocery stores in every neighborhood. I see children growing up with a smile in their heart. Well, I personally believe uh, Detroit is on the front porch of the greatest urban comeback story in this nation's history. So um, we, we are fearless about the future of Detroit. And Stephen and Nolan are back here. You know, we do have to talk about the event that we had here tonight that was actually cut short because while we had about 200 people in the audience, there were pockets of protesters who were intent on disrupting the entire conversation. Uh, no matter how many times you ask for respectful discussion, they were intent on trying to drown out the governor, uh, Judge Rhodes, and our panels looking at, at some of the deals. Is that just people looking to make a name for themselves, Nolan? Or can you really attribute this to the passion that people still feel and the anger that they feel about the process that the city went through? I mean, you've got a group of union um, discontents who follow the mayor everywhere. You've got a group who follow the governor everywhere. You know, I think these were professional protesters or, you know, it might reflect sort of a disturbing trend we're seeing across society that people feel their grievances are so great it entitles them to be the only ones who are heard, to shout down everyone else. It was a shame because it was a good program and the people who were, the vast majority of people who were here to hear it didn't get a chance to finish. Last word on this from you. Well, I mean, I think the, the, I respect the passion that these people have and I respect the position that they're taking. Uh, not everybody was in favor of the bankruptcy and, and that's democracy, right? Uh, we, we make a decision, some people like it, some people don't. I, have, I take every issue, however, with the tactics that they employed. I mean, you don't have a right to assert your opinion over everyone else's uh, in a public forum where there's an event taking place uh, and disrupt it to the point where nobody gets to hear uh, what, what was planned that night. Uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, as I said to the crowd uh, the, tonight, that is not uh, Detroit behavior and it's not okay. I mean, we, we, we let them win uh, in a way that I was not entirely comfortable with uh, that, that night and uh, that's unfortunate. Well, one person we did not hear from was Mayor Duggan. We hope to hear from him in, in, in the coming weeks and get a chance to really sit down and talk to him about some of the things that have happened mm -hmm. here in the city. One of the things that I do want to talk about, Nolan, is public safety because people do list that as one of the high priorities that they have, crime in the city. And, and one of the things that they've used to track is to look at response times from police. And, and our partners at Bridge Magazine through the DJC try to take a look at those that response time number before bankruptcy and then after bankruptcy. And it's a little hard really to compare because they've changed the parameters so is that really a good way to measure how our police force is doing it's one way to measure and again if you look at where we were before bankruptcy the, re the response times were so poor even improving them by 50 percent doesn't get you anywhere close than you to where you need to be and you have to address public safety people have to feel reasonably safe in their neighborhoods if you're going to repopulate Detroit and it's not just from you know the criminals the people breaking in your house it's basic things like animal control. That story last week about the mother whose baby was snatched out of her arms and eaten by wild dogs, you cannot attract people to your neighborhoods if that sort of thing is still going on. Well, you're having a tough time attracting actual officers to join the police force. You've got a police force here that's severely understaffed. It's understaffed, it's underpaid, uh, it's 
the toughest duty you can imagine. Though they just said that there's going to be a 4% pay raise. It's going to be a pay raise. A I mean, one, but... Again, and that's that's a reflection of what the bankruptcy gets you. It gets you a little bit of room to, to put some more money into the services uh, that matter. But that 4% raise still doesn't bring them up to the, to the statewide average, to the Southeast Michigan average. It is not a job that most people looking at, you know, uh, risk assessment would decide to go do. And we got to change that if we want more people to sign up for it. Let's talk about neighborhoods, Nolan. Um, and the mayor has had a very ambitious plan to demo a lot of homes, mm -hmm. take a lot of that blight away. Um, and so then there's conversation about what do you put in its place and have you done it the right way? And oh my gosh, are we even going to have enough federal funding or any other money to continue to take down mm -hmm. the number of houses that need to come down? And I think that's one area where you can um, uh, ask some questions about the, the mayor's performance and that department's performance. The cost of the per house cost of, of blight uh, remediation has skyrocketed under his watch, and he's got a lot of answers for that. He's got a lot of reasons for it, but still, the higher that cost goes, the fewer houses you can tear down. And it's went from about 10,000 to 16,000. That's a lot fewer houses than people had hoped would be torn down that will get torn down. And I think he's really got to address that per house cost a lot more aggressively. What do you think, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, uh, you want to go fast and you want to uh, narrow that window by which you eliminate all the blight. But, you know, as Nolan says, if you're paying so much per house, you're going to go through the money faster uh, than, than, than you need to. He hasn't really answered all of the questions about why the cost went up as high as it did. I wish he would do that. Uh, but I do respect the, the, the sort of calculation he's making here, which is uh, to some degree, look, let's try to go faster. Let's try to get more of these houses down in more of the city so that we can make the case for reinvestment in neighborhoods sooner than we anticipated. I think that's a great goal. Uh, the, the question is whether uh, the, the, the cost that's gone up justifies it. But the other part of that is, I, one part where I would say they're on the right track, is trying to keep so many houses from getting on the teardown list, uh, trying to uh, attract buyers, people who are willing to rehabilitate homes that are still, the bones are still in yeah, pretty good have, shape. Yeah, because if you have a hole in the neighborhood, then you have a yeah. hole in the neighborhood. You'd rather have someone there who's Absolutely. then gonna pay, gonna pay taxes. Let's talk a little bit about education before we leave this. No, let, let me ask you, what kind of traction is happening in Lansing right now in terms of the governor's deal um, in, in moving some kind of school reform well, forward? Well, here we are now. It's um, middle of December almost, right. and he still hasn't dropped that bill. It was supposed to come in November, and then, it, then they push it off to December. I think now they're gonna break off the, the financial part and just try to fix the, the money problem, the debt, uh, the operating deficit, and do that first. The, the problem with that is you lose a whole lot of leverage with the, the, with the city um, to fix what else is wrong with the, uh, with the schools if you take care of the debt and deficit first. Let me ask you, Stephen, about the culture at City Hall. How, how have we changed in the last year or so since bankruptcy, do you think? Well, I think bankruptcy had very little to do with the, the, the culture at City Hall. I mean, I think the, the voters in Detroit have been hard at work on that for a couple of cycles now. You look at the 2009-2013 elections, uh, there were a lot of new faces added to City Council. Uh, we've had, we've gone through two mayors since that time. Um, I, I think that's a long, long-term proposition that Mike Duggan is is focused on in a, a, a pretty direct way, uh, updating systems, you know, the computer systems were antiquated, they're keeping tax rolls with a pen and uh, paper mm -hmm. uh, when he got there. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think there is some financial and fiscal discipline that's enforced uh, by, uh, by the bankruptcy and the subsequent oversight from the state. Who that's stands important. out? Who's shown? of these newcomers? Uh, John Hill, who's the, the, the city finance uh, chief, uh, I think is a really uh, interesting and, and dynamic uh, character. And Beth Nyblock, who is the new technology officer, I think is, is working miracles in terms of just bringing the city into the 20th, and in some case, the 20th century in terms of technology. All right, we only have about 30 seconds left. I'm gonna ask you both, <clears throat> so give me a nice short answer. But what do you see now in year two after Detroit has emerged from bankruptcy. What do you think the city should be tackling or really focus on this next year, Nolan? Got to fix the property tax system. You've got to get more revenue coming in. 
Okay. Yeah. Steven? And growth. Growth is growth is where the mayor's uh, attention has got to be focused. You are not going to solve the problems without more people in the city living here, paying taxes uh, to generate the revenue we need to provide better services. Stephen Henderson, Nolan Finley. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. And that is going to do it for this special edition of My Week from Wayne State University. You can see the entire Detroit Journalism Cooperative program on our website at myweek.org. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night. We'll see you next week.